And God has given us so many ways to appreciate the work of salvation that he accomplished in Christ Jesus. No matter where you look in the Bible, Jesus is there. In Luke 24, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus met two disciples, we believe most likely Cleopas and his wife Mary. And he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And I guess as Christadelphians, we're probably unique is the fact that we see Christ all over the Bible. But I want you to think how the Lord Jesus Christ as a boy would have read those scriptures. The things concerning himself. He was utterly and totally familiar with the things concerning himself. He didn't read the Bible with a sense of detachment. He realized that from the time that God created, through the fall, through the promises, through the prophets, through the Psalms, that he was always there. His thoughts were recorded. What people would do to him was recorded. How others would respond was recorded. And no Jewish boy ever had cause to read the scriptures as intently as that boy Jesus would have done. On the day of the crucifixion, as he hung there in agony, in his mind he was ticking off one by one the prophecies that needed to be fulfilled. And in the end he had to say, I thirst, so that they would give him the vinegar. That was the last thing that had to be done. And he'd been ticking them off one by one. They parted my, lot, my, my garments by lot. And he, all those things had come to pass. The things concerning himself. And he went to the prophets and to Moses and to the law and to the Psalms for those things. Now notice how much the disciples got the point. In Luke 24, verse 32, I'll read it to you. You know it very well. They said one to another, did not our hearts burn within us? And that's what we hope to achieve this morning. As we sung in that hymn, our hearts lit by the heavenly flame. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way and he opened to us the scriptures? Our hearts need to burn, brethren and sisters, as we, with hindsight, look back at those same scriptures and see how accurately what happened to Christ was predicted in them. Later on, he said to the eleven, to the eleven, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things might be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So Jesus was incredibly focused on the things concerning himself, as you would expect him to be. <laughs> Because he understood from that his mission, his purpose, what God required of him, and the terrible sacrifice he would have to make. The things concerning himself. You think about what he knew about. He knew about the seed of the woman having to bruise the head of the serpent. He knew about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He knew about the singular seed of Abraham that would possess the gate of his enemies. He knew about Melchizedek, who was uniquely recorded in the Bible in such a way that he looks like the Son of God. The amazing, accurate parallel of the offering of Isaac, the same place, the same beloved son, the son carrying the wood to the place of sacrifice, the son cooperating with the father, and a virtual resurrection that takes place. And then the incredible type of Joseph, which includes the death and resurrection process of the Lord, the betrayal, the suffering, the glory, it includes bread and wine and finally results in the salvation of the world. The Messianic Psalms, where all his thoughts were predicted. The Emmanuel and Servant prophecies, the sufferings of Jeremiah, perhaps after Joseph, the, the next greatest type of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is so much foretelling of the work and the thoughts of Jesus the Saviour. Not so well recognised is that the book of Zechariah has an amazing amount of information and data about the work and life of Jesus. Now these are the direct prophecies. These are the verses from Zechariah that are quoted directly into the New Testament concerning him. Thy king cometh unto thee, riding upon the colt, the foal of an ass. Awake, O sword, against the shepherd. I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. They weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. The 30 pieces of silver are cast into the potter's field. They will say to him, what are these wounds in thy hand? There was the prediction of crucifixion, which was not the way that Jews put to death when Zechariah wrote this. 
It was only under a Roman governorship that they had the crucifixion as a possibility. But Zechariah said, there will be wounds in his hands. They shall look upon me that they have pierced. Again, a remarkable prediction in a Jewish chronicle. So there are direct prophecies quoted about the Lord Jesus Christ into the New Testament. Details about his ministry and the outcomes of what he would do are also abundant from Zechariah. He would work with and teach the lost sheep. I am sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's straight from Zechariah 11 verse 11. The people would recognize the word of God in him. And they said, how the hell knoweth this man so much, having not learned at our schools? This man, they said, he speaks great words. They couldn't resist his words. Even when they tried to arrest him, they said, no man spake like this man. His focus was on the poor of the flock. The good shepherd has conflict with the evil shepherds. This is all from the prophecy of Zechariah 11. I hated them, he says. I, I hated those evil shepherds. And so he did. Woe well unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. So there was this conflict between the good shepherd and the evil shepherds. Because the evil shepherds were devouring the flock. You devour widows' houses, he said. He quoted Zechariah. You devour. Just like the shepherds devour the flock, you devour widows' houses. He would be meek and lowly of heart. In contrast to Alexander the Great, Christ would come meek and lowly of heart, not arrogant and proud like Alexander. The blood of the covenant would open the grave in Zechariah chapter 9. He would be saved in his own sacrifice in Zechariah chapter 9. His resurrection would be the first of many prisoners to come out of the grave. From the pit room there is no water. AD 70 would come upon the Jews because of their wickedness. And that's prophesied in Zechariah 11 in two different places. And the most remarkable one of all, just come to Zechariah chapter 11. Look at this one. This one's important because we're going to come back to this at the end of our talk. In Zechariah 11 and verse 6, the Jews would be delivered into the hand of their king. For I will no more pity the inhabitants of the land, saith Yahweh, but lo, I will deliver the men, everyone, into, the, into his neighbor's hand. You know, they were killing each other. If you read the history before AD 70 or at the time of the siege, they were murdering each other in great numbers amongst the different factions in, in the temple. And to the hand of his king, and they will smite the land, and out of their hand I will not deliver them. And we're going to see the mob cried out, we have no king but Caesar. And God gave them Caesar in big lumps till they were sick of Caesar. But they'll be delivered to the hand of their king. So there was the direct prophecy of AD 70. And the words they would cry out, we have no king but Caesar. God says, if that's your king, well, you can have Caesar. So there are direct details about the ministry of Jesus that we find from Zechariah. Now look at the allusions we find from Zechariah. These are where visions were given and they have typical significance later on. A faithful high priest laboring with his brethren to build God's house in chapter 3. That faithful high priest lays the foundation stone in Zion. In chapter 4, he becomes the headstone of the corner. So the work that God started is going to be finished. A change of garments is given to this faithful high priest. Change from soiled garments of humanity into garments of immortality. He's then crowned as a king priest. The man whose name is the branch will build the house of God. He'll become the king priest of the age to come. The commander of God's army of saints. And we could go on about all the glorious pictures we have in Zechariah that illustrate the kingdom. Chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 14. You know, this book is incredibly full of essential information for those who want to know about the things concerning Jesus and the things concerning the kingdom of God. How avidly would Jesus have read these prophets to find the things concerning himself? Now we're going to look at something that happened when the temple was being built following the restoration from Babylon. I want to just give you a thumbnail sketch of the history because we, re we really want to focus on the character involved. A small remnant had come back under the decree of Cyrus, less than 50,000 people. They faced the massive task of rebuilding the temple that had be and it, they began it with enthusiasm and joy. But then the Samaritans and the Arabs got into the act and oppressed them and, and the work ground to a halt. Apathy and selfishness set in to the people. They justified laziness. The time is not right. And of course, there are several 70-year periods you can take. They said, well, maybe this is not the right one. 
the light of that was that if it wasn't the right time to build the temple, it wasn't the right time to panel their houses with cedar. And that was the challenge of Haggai. You consider your ways. If you say the time is not right, you shouldn't be decorating your homes because they were destroyed at the same time as the temple. And through Zechariah, God gave amazing visions of glory. We have these night visions that go from Zechariah 1 to 6, designed to inspire the faithful few who had resumed the building work. What God did in these visions is made them aware of the intense angelic activity that was going on around them. You know, Ezra says in 5 verse 5, the eye of their God was upon the builders, and the angels are God's eyes that run to and fro through the earth. What God was interested in in the world at this stage was the builders and the spirit of the builders. The faithful high priest Joshua, who'd come back with the captivity, and the governor Zerubbabel, they reignited a remnant to work after receiving their own personal visions of encouragement. The bulk of the people had said, well, it's all too hard, too much opposition, we've got a letter from Persia that says we can't do it, we're going to go home and look after our own properties. But there was a remnant that came to the temple site and worked hard to finish that temple. Joshua and Zerubbabel typified both the king and the priest of the age to come and the work that they were now doing. And God reassured them the angels would go forth to make sure the work was accomplished. God would move kings. He would cause the kings of Persia to to actually not be able to sleep and call for certain scrolls. The angels were everywhere present around this time of history because God was interested in the day of small things. And what God did most of all in in the visions of Zechariah was say to them, lift your minds to the eternity of what you're doing. The latter glory of the house is more important than the bricks you're currently building. There are eternal outcomes in what you're doing here on this this terrible, destructive building site they were on with all the burnt stones and broken stones. God says there's a greater work involved here. It's actually what you're building in the people, the spirit of the builders. And they came to see that their humble work graphically portrayed the Messiah, his labours, his disciples and his death. You know, there's a tremendous inspiration in these visions. No wonder God was so interested in this particular time of history. No wonder this is the most active time of the angels that you'll read about in the Bible. No wonder God moved dramatically to move Persian kings. No wonder he turned the enemies to flight. In the end, the enemies were paying for the temple to be finished. That's how God can move. The Samaritans and the Arabs had to pay for the temple to be finished. So let's come to Zechariah chapter 3. We have this incredibly clear type of the Lord Jesus Christ in Zechariah 3. Now this is essential. We will get to Josiah, but we must do Zechariah 3 first. Because Joshua the high priest is there in chapter 3 and in chapter 6. His personal visions, he has one personal vision and he has a little enactment that takes place at the end of chapter 6. But we've got to do chapter 3. Now, this vision in chapter 3 opens with our heaven sees the situation. They thought that they were so oppressed, that that it's so hard, everything's going against us. The vision of chapter 3 in Joshua, in Zechariah, is all about how God sees the work of Joshua. And this is the vision they saw. They saw the Yahweh angel standing there, Satan, at the right hand of Joshua, trying to stop the work. So here are the adversaries. These are the Samaritans that tried to stop the work. Standing at his right hand. Now, your right hand is your hand of mobility, except for some of the crazy left-handers, but but it's it's a major hand. It's the thing with which you do things. So he's at his right hand. So the work is being obstructed by the Samaritans. And God says, look, Joshua, this is how I see it. My Yahweh angel, which is Michael, says Jude, is standing right between the two of you. And he's going to rebuke the Satan for you. You imagine how they felt when they were told later on they've got to pay for the temple to be built. And what a rebuke that would have been. But God says, look, Joshua, I know it's hard. I know it looks like you're on your own, but you are not alone. There are angels everywhere here. And there are two mighty angels in Zechariah 3. There's in verse 1, and he. Now, who's the he? Well, the he is the communicating angel. This is Gabriel. This is the one that I am sent to show you these words. This is the one that comes to John, to Daniel. He's the communicator. So you've got Gabriel right at the start of this vision. He is right there with, with Zechariah. And he says, you look at Michael. So you've got the two, the two mighty angels here, the two archangels. So just keep that in mind because that's important a bit later on. 
So the vision that Joshua gets is about the work he has to do. Now, incredible, isn't it? This particular high priest in history is Joshua. The name means Yahweh's salvation. It's the Hebrew form of the name Jesus. We could easily read chapter 3, verse 1, and Gabriel showed me Jesus. That's exactly how it would read in the Hebrew. And Gabriel showed me Jesus. This vision is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Just look at verse 8. Here's the proof of that in verse 8. And now, Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, you and your disciples, they are men wondered at. Have your margins there? You've got men of sign. Typical men. This vision is all about portraying the future work of Jesus Christ based upon what's happening to Joshua the high priest in Jerusalem. So this is a type. This is a, a foreshadowing of the work of Christ. This is the scriptures and the prophets concerning himself that he would have avidly read. Now the high priest at this time should have been arrayed in garments of glory and beauty. That's what a high priest normally had to wear. But there are so few builders that the high priest has to go down to the building site and work on the building site. And so he's got soiled garments. Look what it says in verse 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. So he's standing right alongside God's angel, but he's clothed in garments that have now been soiled by the fact that he's having to work on the broken stones, the burnt stones of the temple. So there's, there's part of the type, isn't it? That prefigures the man, Jesus the one who was tempted in all points like as we are, the one who shared the toils and pains of humanity, the one who identified with our proneness to sin, made like unto his brethren, prepared to forego his privileged position as the Son of God, to labour amidst the broken ruins of humanity. That's prefiguring the work of the Lord Jesus Christ so clearly. Now let's come to verse 4 and pick up the type of Jesus that we follow through here. Having laboured to create God's house from broken stones, Joshua is found at the end of the day clothed in filthy garments. Now that just wasn't happened on one day. That was every day he went home with filthy garments. Just tuck that away. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him. So Michael now addresses the other angels, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto, unto Joshua he says, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee and I will clothe thee with the change of raiment. So here is the Lord Jesus Christ, clothed in filthy garments. Let me specify particularly what we mean by that. He was found in fashion as a man. He never sinned. He didn't have to actually make an offering for his sinful body. What he did was he identified with us by taking our humanity. He himself likewise took part of the same, proneness to sin that you and I have to battle with. And in that sense, he was clothed in filthy garments. But there came a time when the angel said, take away that from him. I've caused thine iniquity to pass from me. So Joshua was forgiven his sins that he had because of his dedicated service to work with his brethren. And the Lord Jesus Christ, death hath no more dominion over him, says Romans. There came a time when he was glorified and made immortal no longer prone to sin. It says he has ceased from sin. He was no longer subject to mortality. And so we have a change to immortality in verse 4, a change of raiment. Fascinating, isn't it? That it was ministered by the angels that stood by. When Mary Magdalene looked into the tomb, she saw two angels sitting. There's only a couple of times in the whole Bible you find angels ever sitting down. They were indicating by sitting down that their work to that stage, their great work of bringing the Messiah into the world and making the sacrifice to save the, the humanity, it had now been accomplished. They sat down in the tomb and there were two of them, Gabriel and Michael. The same two on the Mount of Olives. But why did they sit down and what was between them? Well, what they had between them was the grave clothes of the high priest. And there between them were the clothes Jesus had left behind. The symbol of his humanity, his proneness to sin, his mortality. And the angels took that away. But then we notice that there was a change also in verse 5. And I said, 
Zechariah gets involved in this vision. And I said, so now here's Zechariah who represents you and me. And he requests the crowning of the high priest. Not the angels. This is a beautiful type. Who's going to crown the high priest when he comes to be the king of glory? Well, it's going to be you and I, brethren and sisters. He's acting on our behalf. We will will call for the Savior to be acclaimed as our Lord and King. Thou hast redeemed us out of every people and nation and tongue. Crown him Lord of all. And so it will be. Well, then in verse 6 and 7, the angel now speaks directly to Joshua the high priest and promises him equality with the angels. You know, verse 7 is that wonderful verse, I will give you right of access to walk amongst those that stand by. You're going to join these angels that I'm directing, says Michael. So there's a very personal promise. And then in verse 8, we have the men of Sin. Now notice in verse 8 who the men of Sin are. It's not just Joshua. It's also his disciples. Thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men of Sin. And as a result, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Now, again, just notice the word branch, because in chapter 6, that's part of the prophecy of chapter 6. Jesus will be the shoot of the house of Jesse, the root and the offspring of David. Now, these men of Sion sat at the feet of Jesus as the teacher. That was the scene we have here. You know, that was the normal work of a teaching priest. Malachi says the people should seek the Lord his mouth. The priest's lips should impart knowledge. The young Saul of Tarsus sat at the feet of Gamaliel. And you imagine this, this scene. that, you know, During the heat of the day, Joshua laboured on the temple site. The work was hard, heaving stones and carrying burdens, soiling his garments. And as the evening came, though tired and worn out physically, he would sit around with the faithful remnant and he'd teach them the words of God. And that was a greater work than building stones. There was no rest for this man who was, must have been so weary doing unfamiliar work. It's like we have a working bee and all the clerks and the, you know, the people that work in offices come out and they, you know, by lunchtime they've had it. So here's a man that is not used to this work. Our Lord Jesus Christ would also work amongst humanity. Look, think of all the day long he dealt with the problems and burdens of humanity. Crowded by desperate, needy and lost stones. And then at night, going to teach his disciples in the open sometimes, on mountainsides, in the house at Bethany. And they sat at his feet and he had to give and give more at a time when he was probably mentally exhausted. And the angel watching over Joshua's little Bible class with intense interest because they saw that he was shaping the most important stones of all, the ones fit for God's temple. And it says in verse 9, All of this process is laying a foundation stone. Behold the stone I've laid before Joshua. So God's laying a foundation stone in Joshua. He said, God said, look, there's one stone in that house that's critically important. It's the cornerstone. And I've engraved that stone, says God. I will engrave the graving thereof, saith Yahweh of hosts. So this particular stone upon which which the rest of the house depended was the one that God had carved with his own hands. His own son, fearfully and wonderfully made, that he might be able to be sinless to make the right offering. And the angels were intensely interested. There were seven eyes upon that stone, says verse 9. Seven eyes watching it, complete and utter guidance of the whole work. What would it result in? It would bring two things. Salvation from sins. I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. God will take away our sins in one sacrifice. One sacrifice. Do yourself a favour sometime. Go through Hebrews 7 to 10 and colour in the word one, once, once for all. Jesus made the one sacrifice that would open the path of forgiveness and take away the burden of mortality. The end result in verse 10, you've got the kingdom of God. Every man under his vine and under his fig tree. And that's where the work of Christ is going to end up, in the kingdom of God. So there's the background to chapter 6 because... What we find in chapter 6 is that God comes back to Joshua, the son of Josedek. Now come to Zechariah chapter 6. So having seen that particular personal vision to Joshua and the intent of it that it was to portray the work of Jesus Christ, we now come to the end of the night visions. Now you may be aware that in Zechariah the book's divided into two halves. 
chapter 1 to 6 was in the, was in the particular time that God wanted them to build the temple. Chapter 7, verse 1, it came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius. So that's later. It's after the temple is finished. A different problem emerges. So the book of Zechariah has two definite time periods that are apart from each other. But the first section concludes at the end of chapter 6, not with a vision. It concludes with an enactment, a little role play. A bit more than that, perhaps, a real thing that happens. This is real life in chapter 6, verse 9 to 15. So it's not a night vision. They've ended. This one is something that now happens directly to Joshua. And it's a crowning ceremony. And it's undertaken by Zechariah on our behalf. This is full of exhortation and prophecy, brethren and sisters. Let's paint the scene in verse 9. And the word of Yahweh came to me saying, now I believe it was probably the next morning after the night visions. What's the scenario? Well, there's three men that have arrived from Babylon. Probably they were the leaders of a, another going up. So we have this, this, this arrival of people. They weren't part of the first Aaliyah. They weren't part of Ezra's second Aaliyah. But they had come of their own initiative to, from Babylon to support the work in Jerusalem. Heldai, Tobijah and Jediah, which are come from Babylon. So here were important Jews that had actually come with gifts for the house of God. So, Zechariah, you've got something now to do. You've seen those visions, now enact this out. They're bearing precious stones. In verse 15, we're told that they've come to build in the temple of Yahweh. So here are more people willing to build the house of God. Now, who were they? Well, meaning of names sometimes are interesting. Heldai. Some say it means worldly. So perhaps he represents scattered Israel and the Gentiles. In verse 15, they are called those that are far off which certainly is the title of the Gentiles you'll find in Ephesians chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3. Those that are afar off. The Septuagint translates his name as the useful one, which perhaps is more that we'd, we'd take that one if we had to pick. Tobijah, Jesenius says it means pleasing to Yahweh. I'll accept that one. And Jeliah, also happy to accept that one for whom Yahweh cares. Now, you'll find variations on meanings of names, but I think those names are quite good. The useful one, pleasing to Yahweh, and for whom Yahweh cares. And God certainly cares for them in this particular prophecy. What we do know, they'd all come out of Babylon. In Revelation 18, verse 4, God says to the Jews, after Armageddon, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. And these had left Babylon willingly to come with these gifts for the temple. Given up the comforts of settled life in Babylon, They've come to toil in God's house in the day of small things. They typify the diaspora and the Gentiles, those are far off, who will come in the age to come to help build the temple. The wealth of the Gentiles shall flow unto thee. We're told about the temple of the age to come. Now notice what Zechariah the prophet has to do. So we now see the instructions to Zechariah. You go, Zechariah, to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. So if you've got men that have arrived from Babylon overnight, where would you go to find them? Well, God tells them, I tell you where they are. They've gone straight to the high priest. Exactly what Ezra did on the second Aaliyah. He went straight and he, to the priest. He delivered the vessels. So the Bible just assumes that you will find Joshua in the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. That's where he lives. Because it's the morning. It's breakfast time. That's where you'll find him. Go to the house of Zephaniah and you will find Joshua there with these men that have arrived from Babylon. And I want to focus upon this man, Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. We have a man here that is a faithful supporter of Joshua, the high priest. Maybe he was too old or too frail to work on the temple site. But when the high priest came home, tired, covered in soot, mentally exhausted, Someone's got to wash his clothes. Someone's got to prepare his meals. And he's living in the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. And God had noticed the work of Josiah. Verse 11. Here's what Zechariah has to do. Make, take silver and gold. So take some of the wealth they have brought and go and make a crown. The RV has the crown of a king. Now it's a single crown. All right. It's not crowns it's a single crown cross out the s make a single crown and in the hebrew it's a particular type of crown it's a crown with multiple circlets 
It's a crown that indicates kingship over many dominions. It's the crown of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. How sad. The Catholics, in their apostasy, made a triple tiara for the papal states. But this is a crown for the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. So it's a multiple single crown, multiple circlets on it to indicate many dominions. And set it upon the priest, uh, set it upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. Well, again, the names are significant. Josedek means, Yah- sorry, Joshua means Yahweh's salvation. Josedek means whom Yahweh makes righteous. What an incredible combination of names that this high priest had for the work that he was to typify. Yahweh's salvation, whom Yahweh makes righteous. Just make a note of Jeremiah 23, verse 5 and 6. It shall come into the world, a king shall reign in righteousness, whose name is the branch, says Jeremiah 23. And this is the name with which he shall be known, Yahweh our righteousness. Exactly what we read here. Joshua, the son of Josedek. And the prophet does the crowning. So again, that links up with chapter 3, verse 5. When it comes to crowning the high priest, that's the work of the saints. It's what we read in the Apocalypse, isn't it? The living ones. We are the living ones of the Apocalypse. They give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who lives forever and ever. We fall down with the four and twenty elders. We are the throne of David, the house of David in the age to come. And we worship him that liveth forever and ever. And cast their crowns before his throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power. For thou hast created all things. For thy pleasure they are and were created. And the work of Jesus will only be finally completed when he's anointed in the midst of his brethren and crowned with glory and honour. And we acclaim him as Lord of all. So go and crown the high priest. We look forward to that privilege, don't we, brethren and sisters? And then we have the speech that Zechariah now, must now make in verse 12. Speak unto him. And behold the man whose name is the branch. Joshua, you are representing my branch, the branch of Yahweh's planting, the shoot out of the stump of Jesse. You are the branch, Joshua, you represent him. I want to just follow quickly through on the screen some of the quotes about the Lord Jesus Christ growing out of the Abrahamic roots, the shoot from the stump of the house of Jesse that was cut down. In Isaiah 53, at his first appearing, the Lord Jesus Christ was a little tender shoot from that stump of the house of Jesse, a root out of dry ground. No form of comeliness. He was a very small shoot and they cut it off, but the branch would regrow. It shall come forth a rod, another branch coming out of the stump of Jesse. We all know, don't we, you cut down a gum tree. If you don't poison it, it will come back and grow again, much bigger. A branch shall go out of his roots. The spirit of Yahweh shall rest upon him. And we know Isaiah 11 is about the kingdom and and, and the wisdom and and the understanding of Jesus Christ. But he was that little shoot from the stump of Jesse that would come forth. The days come, says Yahweh, raised unto David, a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper. So when you have branch, you are immediately associated with the king on the throne of David. He shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. And how does Jesus sign off in the book of Revelation? What is the last title Jesus applies to himself? I have sent my name to testify these things in the Ecclesiastes. I am the root and the offspring of David. I'm there in the stock of Israel and the promises to Abraham. And I'm the branch that will fill the earth with glory, the bright and the morning star. And that's the last bracket of titles Jesus used of himself. He is the branch. Well, it goes on to say in Zechariah 12, and he shall bear the glory. Christ will bear the glory on two times in the world. First, when he came, it says in John 1, the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. We beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And in the kingdom, he will also bear the glory. This is Isaiah 22, another prophecy about the king. The king of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. 
He shall open and none shall shut. And Jesus tells us in Revelation, that is the guarantee of the resurrection for the house of David. He'll be a nail in a sure place, utterly reliable for a glorious throne. There again is the connection of the kingdom to all this. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house. So Joshua would bear the glory. Jesus will certainly bear the glory of the age to come. And he shall sit in verse verse 13 and rule upon his throne. So this is a prophecy about a king. But he's also a priest. In verse 13, he shall be a priest upon his throne. This is the Melchizedek order being reinstated. And he shall build the temple of Yahweh. What interest that would be to somebody who was laboring with broken stones. This man's going to build the house with the latter glory, says Haggai. Far more stupendous than the humble one they were building. Far more than Solomon's temple or Herod's temple. The house of the age to come will be a magnificent structure and Christ will build it. And you go to the prophecy of Ezekiel about the temple. It says, and he built it. As Ezekiel was going on his tour, the temple's coming up in front of him. He's building it as he goes. He was the builder of the house to come. Verse 13 just emphasizes the same point. Even he shall build the temple of Yahweh. Joshua was typical of the Lord Jesus Christ. He builds both a literal temple of living stones, sorry, a literal house of prayer, and a spiritual house made up of living stones. And it repeats it. Even he shall build it. There's no doubt as to who this person will be. So, Jesus Christ is the focal point of this little prophecy in verse 12 and verse 13. He will be the strength and the power of the age to come, and nations will flow to his father's house. And for them, the greatest privilege that they will have in the kingdom is to see the Son in his glory, to see Yahweh on earth, to see the Father of the age. And you imagine the excitement. They'll go home, back to their families, wherever they came from in the world, and to say, we saw the glory of the Son of God. He shall be a priest upon his throne. The Melchizedek order reestablished. And the council of peace, it says in verse 13, the meeting between peace and justice between mercy and righteousness shall be perfectly balanced in the Lord Jesus Christ. The council of peace shall be between them both. A king makes laws and enforces them. A priest brings men back to God. And the kingdom will be the perfect balance of the two. Now notice something critical in verse 14. If you've got a pen there and you haven't seen this before, just get it out. These There were other crowns. Because now we have in verse 14, and the crowns. Now, there were obviously other crowns that had been made. There were four other crowns that were made up for this particular occasion. There was that one particular crown in verse 11. That's in the singular. But in verse 14, there were other crowns that that he, he had to have. Because other people were crowned on the same day. Certainly Jesus will be crowned in the midst of his brethren. But there are others who will become kings and priests in the age to come. And this is dedicated as a memorial to the men who will not be forgotten when Christ is crowned. Now, and the crowns shall be to Helam. Now, who's Helam? Well, that's the Syriac version of Heldai. You can check that with the RSV and Rotherham. So that's Heldai, the same guy from verse 10. The crown shall be to Heldai, Tobijah and Jediah. So there's the three men that came from Babylon. They represent, in this type, those who have come from afar to work in the house of God. They represent us, brethren and sisters. These are the Gentiles that will be crowned. The numbers would be an interesting thought about perhaps the proportion between those who have come from afar and those who were born in the house of Israel. For a memorial in the temple of Yahweh. But there's another person there. And to Hen, the son of Zephaniah. Now, translators sometimes get it horribly wrong. They translate names like Satan when it should be adversary. They put in Lucifer when it should be Daystar. Here they put in a name that should have been translated also. The Hebrew word Hen means the kindness. The kindness. That's what the Hebrew word means. It's not a name. It's what he's like. He's a kind person. 
And God says, in all the people that are working here, Joshua prefigures my son. These people have come from Babylon, prefigure the Gentiles who will come into the house of God to labor there. But let's not forget the humble little man who perhaps could do nothing but look after the high priest and include him in the crowning ceremony also. You know, that tells us a lot about our God, doesn't it, brethren and sisters? God sees everything that happens. He's not enamored by the public things that people see. God can weigh up individual opportunity against performance. God is far more interested in the diligence and the application of the saints than he is in the glorious things we think we might achieve. But the end of verse 15, if you will diligently obey the voice of Yahweh your God, this will happen. You know, God is not awed by the things we give credence to. The parable of the sheep and goats in Matthew 25 says that God is more concerned with the small acts of responsive love that we do instinctively than the very public things that we might achieve where other men see us. God loves the quiet things that are done out of love and appreciation. And he notices them more than perhaps the things for which men pat us on the back and we know that we've had our reward. And in this glorious ceremony, God did not overlook the man who gave faithful kindness to support Joshua in his work. You know, John in his epistle calls people like him fellow helpers to the truth. And you imagine the exhausted Joshua coming home, completely tired physically, mentally worn out by, by perhaps three or four hours of teaching on the temple site as they sat around his feet, thinking what he might have to talk about tomorrow. He needed to be fed. His clothes needed to be washed. There needed to be a bed ready for him to, to flop into. Somebody had to do that, and he's living within the house of Josiah. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ needed the women that followed to provide for his physical needs in rest and food and things they needed to get through the night. He needed the quiet haven of Bethany at the end of the day that he might be fed with his disciples that he might be able to sit and teach those at his feet. And Joshua helped. Joshua was helped by Josiah, the man who did what he could. When you read Romans 16, you find that Paul fondly remembered those that had ministered to him as he went about preaching all over the world. And he remembers them, that they had succored him in the different times of need. He remembered the Philippians. You only Philippians sent to me. We're not all Paul. We're not all teachers like Joshua. But we can all support God's work diligently. We can be fellow helpers to the truth. Whatever this kindness constituted, God says, I want it memorialized in my house because people like that will be in my kingdom. And it says in verse 15, if you will diligently obey the voice, we'll come to the point that we realize the angels have been at work in our lives and God has brought us into his kingdom. All God needs is for us to diligently obey what he's written in his word. But the Roberts said, human action is the basis for divine supervision. In its absence, there's nothing for the angels to work on. The angel says in verse 15, when the work is finished, when the temple is built, only then will we fully realize how much God has been at work in our lives through his angels. Well, let's go to John chapter 19. I want to show you where this whole context was quoted in the New Testament. I'm going to start in John 18. In John 18, we have the Lord Jesus Christ just before his crucifixion. And the issue was, who is the king of Israel? John 18, verse 33. And Pilate entered the judgment hall and said, Jesus, he called Jesus and said, Art thou the king of the Jews? So Pilate was very aware of the problem outside on the streets. That there was this discussion, is he the king of the Jews? So Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? A direct question. In verse 37, Pilate says, are you a king then? He didn't listen to what Jesus said. He said, hang on, I'm not listening to all that palaver. Are you a king? So the issue is, are you the king? Verse 39. He says to the Jews, will I release your king? Chapter 19, verse 1. What do the, the soldiers do? They make him a king in mockery. 
a purple robe, a crown of thorns, and said, Hail the King of the Jews. So this is all about kingship. Verse 14, when he brings him out, Pilate says, Behold your king. And Pilate was provoking the Jews with this, this man that they didn't want for their king. In verse 6, the priests lead the anger against Jesus. The chief priests especially were hostile to Jesus. And they cry out in verse 15, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. And we're told it was the chief priest that said that. Now, why does the Bible say it was the chief priest that said it? Could have been the Pharisees. Could have been the Herodians. Could have been the Levites. But the Bible says, no, the ones who led this public riot against Jesus were the chief priests. They had most to lose. Why were they so incensed? Why were they so determined to get rid of him? Well, during his ministry, there were two themes the Lord had often referred to that annoyed them totally. Number one, when Jesus said he was the son of God and the son of David. If you're the son of David, you're the king of Israel. Everybody knew that. No wonder they mocked him on the cross with, if you are the king of Israel, come down from the cross. So that was the number one issue. His claim to be the king, the son of David. The other thing that annoyed them most of all was the fact that he said, I will destroy and rebuild this temple. That was the charge they brought. When they came before Pilate, you're the one, he says, he will destroy and rebuild the temple. What was the other taunt they heard at, on, what they heard at him when he was on the cross? Number one was, if you are the king of Israel, come down. The second one was, he that said he will build the temple in three days, let him come down now. And they were the two things that were in the minds of all the rabble around the foot of the cross. You think you're the king and you say you can build the temple. We'll start by getting off that cross. So they were the two issues. So why did this crowd get so enraged that they would scream out that we love Caesar? Well, the answer's back there in verse 5. It says there, Then came Jesus forth, wearing the, purple crown, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and saith unto them. Now notice what's in italics. It's not Pilate. It's against all the sense of the Greek because the subject is verse 5, Jesus. The person who utters those words, behold, the man is Jesus. Forget Pilate. The whole, whole sense of the Greek is wrong if you put Pilate in there. They knew his claims to be a temple builder. They knew his claims to be the son of David. And now he reminds them of a very important prophecy, and it's directly from Zechariah 6, verse 12 and 13. Behold the man who shall reign upon the house of David and who shall build the temple of Yahweh, and he shall take over the priesthood of the Melchizedek order. Verse 6, when the chief priest saw where he was going, we're not going to hit the end of that quotation. We know where he's going. He's going to get rid of us. And that's why the chief priests were utterly incensed against him because it would be the end of their priesthood. Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate says, but he's your king. We have no king but Caesar. And God says, I will give you Caesar in great lumps. Remarkable, isn't it, brethren and sisters? That's, they knew where he was going. Behold the man whose name is the branch. And the mob yelled so loudly, that he couldn't get to finish it. But they knew where he was going. They knew their scriptures. Well, brethren and sisters, we do see Jesus as our king. We see him mocked and crucified and we mourn. But we see him risen to immortality, arrayed in new garments. And we wait for him to come to reward his servants. The small, like Josiah, and the great, like Joshua. Let us pray with there to join with all the saints and crown him Lord of all. Well, let's be inspired by Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Let's be encouraged by the way that God does remember all his faithful laborers, no matter in what capacity they serve or how they render their service. You know, it says in Hebrews chapter 6, words you know so well. I'm really going to read them to you from Weymouth's translation. For God is not unjust 
so that he is unmindful of your labour and of the love which you have manifested toward himself in having rendered services to his people and in still rendering them. And that's a beautiful summary of our motivation in the truth, brethren and sisters. We love our heavenly Father for what he's given us in his Son, for the forgiveness of sins that we can constantly have, for the hope of the future that we're so privileged to share. How do we show that love? By rendering services to his people and going on doing it. With diligence, goes on to say. With diligence, that comes from Zechariah chapter 6, verse 15. The same diligence, if you will diligently obey the voice of Yahweh. Weymouth goes on, but we, we long for each of you to continue to manifest the same earnestness or diligence with a view to enjoying fullness of hope to the very end. So that you may not become half-hearted, but be imitators of those like Joshua and Josiah, who through faith and patient endurance are now heirs to the promise. Brethren and sisters, let us rejoice in the fact that God remembers the small as well as the great. And he remembered the kindness of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah.